the session, but l let me say just a few words of introduction by Massimo that it doesn't need, but I'd like to, to do that. Even because it's important that all the people that are, of course, from different university would know today who are the people that are sharing uh, the experience. So Massimo is a, an MD, a PhD, is a full professor of uh, pathology and immunology at the Department of Medical Biotechnologies and Translational Medicine at the University of Milano, and the chief of the Leukocyte Biology Lab at the Humanitas Clinical Re and Research Lab. We, we have a very long lasting experience together because we have been working, uh, we have been starting our research in the same uh, uh, research lab led by Professor Alberto Mantovani, who is now the scientific director of the Humanitas University. So we are coming from the same tree in uh, some way, although very challenging to compete with a the, with the master like uh, Alberto. And he's the coordinator of the PhD program in experimental medicine. And his uh, scientific research interests are in the field of cellular and molecular mechanism involved in resolution of inflammation. So it's, it's a person and, uh, working in that field uh, with a specific aim in the molecular field of the role of regulatory RNA uh, component and mechanism in innate immunity and immune mediated disease. So Massimo will chair all the session and will be responsible for the day and I'm very pleased to introduce and to leave the chair to him. Thank you. Thanks, Massimo. Thank you for the introduction, Andrea. Uh, and I'm also a, a mentor in this program. And my, my mentor is actually sitting there. <laughs> uh, and I'm very pleased to be here because uh, I really believe in this program. I really believe that we need a, a, a path to guide students like you are uh, in this uh, dangerous uh, path between medical uh, studies and uh, research activities. So uh, I really trust in the, in the Virgilio program, but I also really trust we can try at least to find a way to make it uh, uh, officially recognized and uh, acknowledged by the, uh, the Ministry of uh, Research and University. So we are working, as Andrea said, uh, to that. Because of that, uh, you are invited to uh, participate uh, in another meeting which will be held uh, about a month from now, 18 November. And uh, I believe Sara will actually advertise that from the uh, uh, student's point of view. So I leave to her uh, that job. But please uh, make a note on your agenda because this will be uh, the next uh, step for us and it's relevant uh, to all of us, actually to all of you, to be there. Now, having said that, uh, we move to science, let's say. And it is really my pleasure to introduce uh, Nicola. Nicola, I'm here. Nicola is an associate professor in hematology at the University of Milan, my same university. It is a consultant in hematology at the uh, Instituto Nazionale di Tumori here in Milan. He has trained in hematology <clears throat> in Perugia, uh, and then he moved uh, in, uh, abroad. So he is uh, an example of how you can actually uh, perceive this career by having a step here in, in Italy, then uh, outside, and then back in. He moved uh, outside, first in Boston, where he spent the PhD years uh, at the Harvard Medical School, and then uh, in 2011, uh, he, came, uh, uh, he left Boston and he went to Cambridge, where uh, he was a lecturer and he worked there for three years. And then he moved back to Milan. So it's actually very prestigious, as you see, uh, list of uh, uh, institutions in, in, the, in the track. He, Milan, is working as a clinician in a consulting research in the field of genomics and hematological malignancies that is uh, I can say, I believe, uh, the field of interest from the very beginning for him. Oh, right? yes. Almost from the beginning. And he is currently recipient of an ERC grant. ERC grant, I'm not sure many of you are very familiar with. It's actually basically the most prestigious kind of grant that uh, a scientist can get uh, for his own uh, project. 
So it's one of the few examples of uh, uh, research fundings where you are not asked to contribute towards a specific topic that somebody else has chosen for you. You're actually applying your own ideas. So this is very, um, very much uh, to be acknowledged. Very good. Uh, so this is the, 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 the curriculum. Today, topic uh, is basically an overview of what has been his, I believe, findings, but also his uh, personal approach to uh, the multiple myoma uh, uh, example of uh, hematological malignancies. Thanks, Nicola. Uh, Nicola. Uh, all right. Um, thank you, Massimo, for the introduction. Um, thank you, Professor Biondi, Professor Corradini, Richa, for organizing this day and um, uh, inviting me here. Uh, I'm afraid my, sp my, my talk will be much less inspiring um, and will tell you less about the ethics and philosophy that guide us uh, in our uh, professional life at least. Uh, but I, I hope I can give you an overview of, um, I would say, five years worth of work um, in this field and perhaps even take you through the many um, you know, wrinkles and um, different aspects of a research project that starts off in a way and almost always ends up in a, another way. Um, so just to give you a, an example of that, uh, I will speak about multiple myeloma, which is of course a, a lymphoid tumor, uh, as many of you will know. Uh, but I came into this project at first because I was involved in myeloid malignancies, which are a different set of hematological cancers. And a very prominent person in cancer genomics once asked me, because I was somehow expert in myeloid neoplasms, whether I wanted to carry on a myeloma uh, sequencing project. And I said, of course, yes, but it's not that because the two names sound alike. Uh, is that I'm necessarily expert on the second one as well. Uh, so it, life can go in different ways, and I'll show you what I have achieved uh, in in few years, and um, hopefully this uh, will, 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 will be relevant for both a biological point of view, but also uh, for people interested in research can provide an example of how you can somehow achieve some results. Uh, so the basic question uh, I uh, started asking, which is pretty much the question everybody asks, is what makes a, a normal cell uh, into a cancer cell, right? Um, that's the, the basic question. Um, the first thing to realize um, is that when we, when we sequence, when we have a tumor mass in front of us, be it a, a pancreatic cancer or a hematological cancer, we do not have um, a homogeneous um, pool of cells. These cells are clonal, they derive from the same one transformed cell, but they evolve in a different way so that um, the number of cells you analyze, uh, the bulk of cells you analyze, are different one from another. And, and of course, uh, they are different in many ways. There's DNA, RNA, proteins, metabolites, um, environment, you can study these differences in many different ways. DNA is simply the easiest way to study differences between cells because uh, it's a stable uh, molecule which you can reliably sequence and so on and so forth. So let's focus on DNA. Um, and um, this talk will be about NGS especially, that's how, and, and that's next generation sequencing and that's how we get to know uh, the DNA structure of a given tumor. Um, so basically what next generation sequencing does is to take uh, a bulk of cells, uh, lyse them and extract DNA and once you do that you somehow lose the relationship between the DNA molecule and the cell uh, this was in. Uh, so what do you do? You basically uh, sequence a bunch of DNA molecules coming from a bunch of cells and of course you can sequence the whole genome or just exomes uh, or just few genes depending on what your research question is. Uh, but what you do through next generation sequencing and that's different from previous sequencing technologies is that you count, you can count the number of molecules bear, um, bearing mutations for example. Uh, we believe that, well, cancer is a disease of the genome and of course 
uh, if you find DNA alterations in a cancer cell, you can ask whether these alterations are at the basis of cancer development. And by counting these alterations, you can actually try and go back to the cells where these alterations were in and ask how many of them were actually present in old cells. And if we take, for example, uh, alteration A, which could be a mutation, a translocation, or a copy number abnormalities, for example, um, you can do some mathematics and find out that alteration A is more prevalent in your sequencing experiment, and therefore it must have been present in a higher number of cells, and maybe in all cells of the tumor, which will make it a very important lesion because it was there at the time the cell got transformed. Uh, alteration B, for example, uh, is less prevalent in this example, and therefore it is present in fewer tumor cells which makes it fairly intuitive that this alteration was somehow uh, born later after the tumor had already developed. And, uh, you know, going to C and D, you can somehow uh, time um, these DNA lesions based on uh, quantitative data from next generation sequencing. And if you have enough data, you can actually trace a phylogenetic tree that may make you understand what led uh, from a normal cell to a tumor cell, bearing in mind that there are very few examples in life of one genetic lesion that is itself sufficient to transform a, a normal cell. Uh, so here, uh, based on our you know, very rough example, uh, we can say how uh, alteration A uh, was present in the normal cell when the cell got transformed. That does not make it the lesion that uh, transforms the cell, but it makes it a candidate lesion which is worth studying. And then B, of course, uh, uh, arose later and maybe transformed that cell into a more aggressive cell which perhaps could bring this tumor to a clinically evident stage. In the end, evolution can go in branching ways so this is a drawing, this is an example to make you understand uh, the basis of the data I will, I will show you during this presentation. But these are data from real life. Um, so this is um, a next generation sequencing experiment readout where uh, yellow and blue are DNA molecules which are red, uh, left to right, right to left. Uh, and the red boxes are mutated bases. So each box is a base and when that's different from normal, it's red. Um, so as you can see, the output of NGS is digital, which means you can count molecules and you can count how many of them are mutated. And because uh, DNA um, you know, behaves such that each cell has two DNA molecules per position, one from one parent and one from the other parent, um, you can actually try and quantify not just the number of DNA molecules that are mutated, but the number of cells that bear this mutation. And if you take this uh, as a KRAS mutation, so that's an oncogenic mutation, you would say that uh, the sample on the right side um, has a, a KRAS mutation in a higher number of cells than the sample in the left side. And this, uh, again, following our example, can tell us that uh, in, sample, in the right sample, uh, this KRAS mutation arose earlier in cancer development. Um, but there are, of course, caveats, and, uh, and of course, uh, biology is much more complex than that. Um, and that, those caveats relate to a number of variables you have to uh, account for when running such analysis. One is contamination. Of course, if you sequence a chunk of uh, lung cancer, for example, uh, not all cells from this piece of tissue will be part of the cancer. You may uh, find some leukocytes that were circulating. You may find some normal epithelium there. Uh, so it could be that your sample is contaminated and maybe heavily contaminated by normal cells, which of course will not carry um, a, an oncogene mutation. So if uh, we don't account for contamination and this left sample is heavily contaminated, we would have a, a false call. We would underestimate the allelic fraction, uh, the number of mutated reads in this sample. Uh, on the same, um, on another note, but on the same line, um, cancers have aneuploidies. They have copy number abnormalities. And it's very 
frequent, especially for a tumor suppressor, to be mutated, uh, but to have the second copy of the gene uh, deleted. Uh, so if you now take out uh, the second copy of any gene, you reduce the denominator of this allelic fraction. And if you don't account for the copy number status of the locus, you may have, again, on the right sample, uh, a false call where you overestimate uh, the number of cells carrying each mutation. So to make a long story short, uh, we can draw lessons from um, timing of molecular lesions in cancer through NGS data if we account for variables. And we have to think about that. We have to think about the biology underlying the tumor. We have to think about experimental variables as we run the experiment. So there are mathematic uh, formulas to account for these variables. There are tools. This is a tool that's been published now a few years ago, which look at the whole of the genome and tries to return solutions, which will tell you the, um, well, the estimated ploidy of the cancer and purity of the cancer uh, to run these analyses in the most accurate fashion possible. And of course, I'm not going through the specifics of the tools, but I'm just going to put it out there that there is a huge room uh, for development in the field of bioinformatics, and that's a highly um, looked uh, for uh, job specification in research lab nowadays. Uh, but just to give an example of how powerful a genomic study can be, not only we can call mutations, of course, we can also call copy number lesions. Uh, and by copy number lesions, I mean uh, easy things like gains, like trisomies. You know that sometimes chromosomes can be amplified in cancer. And, and we can actually tell, without running any fish or karyotyping experiment, just by sequencing, whether a, a, a chromosome has three copies or four copies, and whether uh, the four copies come from duplication of each of the alleles, or maybe from a um, tetrasomy of one of them. Um, and we can call copy neutral LOH, which is a free, not very frequent, but very instructive occurrence where uh, a, G, a chromosome is deleted, uh, an allele is deleted, and the second allele of the chromosome is duplicated, very frequent around oncogenes. And we can call what's even more important subclonal lesions. Uh, as you can see, uh, all those lines which tell copy number status of the tumor uh, are referenced to the y-axis into integer numbers, one, two, or three. Of course, a cell can have one or two or three chromosomes. Uh, a cell cannot have two and a half copies of a chromosome. Uh, but some of these lesions, for example, this 8P deletion, uh, really points at a 1.5 copy number. And at the single cell level, this is of course impossible, but in a bulk population as the one we usually analyze, what this means is that this deletion is present in half of the cells. And again, this means that this deletion was not present when the tumor first was born, so it's not an initiating lesion, it's a lesion possibly associated with progression. It happens in one cell. If we see it now in half of the cells, it means there's been a positive selection, and this lesion is then a candidate driver. So after this technical introduction, I'm going to move now to the field of multiple myeloma, and multiple myeloma is a blood cancer which is fairly well uh, suited for the study of cancer evolution because it's a disease that um, we know since decades evolves in discrete clinical steps. Uh, there's first what we call a premalignant condition, which, it, which biologically is not premalignant at all, but behaves in a non-malignant fashion in the clinic, and that's called MGAS, monoclonal gammopathy of unknown significance. We believe MGAS results from a transformation of a B cell in the germinal center of a lymph node um, through um, the occurrence of uh, karyotypic lesions, such as IGH translocations and hyperdiploidy. Uh, MGAS can then evolve into smoldering myeloma, which now is a, a proper cancer. We can see cancer cells. Uh, we can see an excess of them in the bone marrow of these patients, but this cancer does not cause end organ damage, so we call it smoldering. And it may uh, 
stay there without causing damage for years and years. Uh, but eventually, many of these smoldering um, patients will progress into what's multiple myeloma, and that's called the active form of the disease. Uh, and really, when you do uh, find someone with myeloma, that implies the patient requires treatment. Whereas in smoldering, the patient does not require treatment, only requires follow-up. Um, so this um, evolution is evident in the clinic. We see it in the patients. We can tell apart an MGAS from a smoldering patient, from a myeloma patient. We do so based on biochemical and imaging tests. Uh, but from a biological and genomic point of view, of course, this evolution implies that something changes in the DNA of these cells, because these cells be behave pro in a progressively more aggressive fashion. And we want to capture what happens at that stage to inform the clinician uh, in a better way on how we can predict and potentially modify this trajectory. So there are a number of open questions. Um, we, we know that initiating lesions are karyotypic lesions. Uh, but we know there are secondary lesions which are associated with progression, which are much less understood. And even less understood is what happens when you start treating myeloma, but myeloma comes back because your treatment did not work uh, well enough. And uh, we think all of these are questions worth asking. Um, so this is, again, um, uh, briefly into the biology of multiple myeloma, you can you know how a naive B cell uh, travels through the germinal center of a lymph node, and there what happens is something very special for a somatic cell in the body. So the DNA of a naive B cell gets rearranged. That's fairly unique. It, it, there are a few examples, maybe hepatocytes, but there are not many examples I know of where a somatic B cell as part of a physiological process uh, gets rearrangements. And that's what happens for B cells. It happens for a, a reason. It happens because that's helpful for our adaptive immunity to be more efficient. But sometimes there are errors associated with this. Every time you cut the DNA or you mutate the DNA, you do it in a very precise fashion through enzymes. AID uh, um, is one of them, of course. Uh, but every time you cut or you mutate, you incur in the risk of having troubles. And these troubles uh, can be translocations, can be aneuploidies. And we believe that during the process of somatic hypermutation and the class switch recombination, which eventually lead to a high affinity uh, plasma cell, uh, something can go wrong. And this plasma cell can now become malignant because of uh, an unwanted rearrangement. Uh, and, and we know there are rearrangements. Uh, this is a circus plot where you see uh, chromosomes on the outer layer, copy number status in this line in the inner layer, and interchromosomal lines are translocations, of course. And you can see how in multiple myeloma, uh, there are recurrent translocations which start at the tip of the long arm of chromosome 14. That's where the IGH locus is, and that's where aid goes to hypermutate and produce a class switch recombination. If something goes wrong, uh, this DNA lesion will cause a translocation towards recurrent oncogenes, of which there are many, and this has the potential to change the behavior of the cell. So we believe this is the uh, initiating uh, event that's present in about half of multiple myeloma cases. Uh, whereas the second half of multiple myeloma cases does not carry translocations, but rather aneuploidies. And you can see that, oddly, in multiple myeloma, trisomies are at the expense of odd-numbered chromosomes. That's a, a, a weird um, uh, observation. Um, then a myeloma cell, which is the one uh, depicted here in blue in the middle, is a cell that, because of these initiating events, uh, activates a number of oncogenic pathways, uh, which, of course, provides a cell autonomous drive towards proliferation and resistance to apoptosis. Uh, but uh, more than other blood cancers, myeloma thrives on the environment uh, through uh, angiogenesis uh, and receiving proliferative and anti-apoptotic signals from the stroma. 
Uh, this is uh, a very interesting field of myeloma research that's uh, slightly harder to study, but current technologies are giving us new tools to address the known cell autonomous aspects of myeloma biology as well. So back to um, research. Um, what are the drivers of neoplastic transformation in myeloma, and can we actually tell the order of acquisition of such drivers? Uh, so we tried to answer these questions uh, applying NGS technologies uh, to uh, multiple myeloma, and um, that was uh, a fairly well-received paper we published a few, few years ago. Uh, so that's the typical study um, of NGS. You have patients in columns, and you have cytogenetic lesions at the top, and you can see hyperdiploid patients, those are the patients with trisomies, and you can see translocated patients on the right-hand side. Uh, on the bottom half, you have mutated genes, and genes are in lines, and of course, each time the gene is mutated, a box is colored, and color code is the type of mutation. Um, so you may have seen such oncoplots from previous, uh, from other studies, other cancers. Uh, what you like from these um, pictures are patterns. You would love to see lines uh, covering most of the width of the figure. You would like lines being uh, associated with others or mutually exclusive with others. Uh, and in myeloma, you don't see much of a pattern. These lines are very short, meaning that not, uh, there are not many genes that are frequently mutated, and you don't see patterns, you don't see streaks, you rather see a drizzle of squares that are colored here and there, which really um, makes us think that multiple myeloma is quite heterogeneous in its uh, mutational landscape. But actually, uh, sorry, what I didn't focus uh, on enough is, uh, you know, at least we do have some genes that are more recurrent than others. And I mentioned KRAS and NRAS. You know, these are very uh, famous oncogenes that are mutated across cancers. Uh, but back in the years, a fairly nice breakthrough in myeloma biology was the discovery of canonical BRAF mutations. BRAF is downstream of, uh, of the RAS genes. And it's, of course, on the same pathway which leads to, phos to phosphorylation of ERK and MAP kinase activation. So this was a big deal at the time because BRAF is druggable. NRAS, KRAS are not. BRAF, we have a drug. Um, so it was thought that you know, these efforts could initially lead to better treatment for patients. And that's, of course, the lowest hanging fruit from a sequencing experiment. Um, but I think what's very important in a sequencing experiment that you know is that uh, not always uh, the presence of, of a mutated gene translates into the possibility of dragging that gene. It's not binary, it's not mutated or not. Uh, first of all, you have to understand which ones are the mutations. And current BRAF drugs are active against mutations in the uh, V600 residue, uh, which is the residue that's most frequently mutated in colon cancer, in thyroid cancer, but in, and in melanoma, of course. Uh, but interestingly, in multiple myeloma, uh, the V600 residue uh, is mutated in the minority of cases, and that's fairly a peculiar pattern for, uh, for a BRAF mutated cancer. But the, sh the short story of this is that if you have 10 mutations, only three of them are actually druggable in multiple myeloma, which makes the slice of the pie very, very small. Uh, so really, uh, dragging BRAF is not an option for most myeloma patients. But it's not just that. You also have to ask the question, and you know you can ask that, uh, how many cells carry a BRAF mutation in each case? Because of course, if you take this case over here, where BRAF is mutated in 100% of cells, if you were able to drug that, you would kill the tumor. You would uh, wipe the tumor out from the body. But if you take, for example, um, this patient over here, where BRAF is mutated in 30% of the cells of the tumor, and you give the best anti-BRAF drug to the patient, the most you can achieve will be a 30% reduction in the tumor size, because that's where BRAF is. So you do have to ask uh, 
uh, not just a binary question, present or absent, but you do have to ask a more sophisticated question if you wanted to translate results into clinical practice. And then there is another notion which is fairly counterintuitive. BRAF is downstream of KRAS or NRAS. So that would suggest that these lesions should be mutually exclusive in a cell because if you mutate one, there is no pressure towards mutating uh, the other molecule which is upstream or downstream. It, it only takes one to activate the pathway. Yet what you do see here is that out of these 30 patients, we could find five which carry multiple mutations in either genes. And that's, that was fairly unexpected at the time, and you need to work out how can this be. So fortunately, uh, there are other people which asked the same question and came up with a smart way to answer. Um, so the smart way to answer is perform single cell analysis. Because your question, when you sequence a bulk of cells, and you do see more mutations uh, coming out of your sequencing experiment is whether these mutations are present in the same cells or different cells of the bulk. And the only way to answer is really go to the single cell level. And what was found through single cell experiments is that uh, multiple mutations of the MAP kinase pathway in multiple myeloma cases are indeed present in different cells of the tumor. So to make it uh, fairly understandable, here we have a cancer, a multiple myeloma, which carries the, the 1114 translocation. That's a founder lesion. It's present in all tumor cells. Uh, then this cancer acquires an ABCA4 mutation in a subset of them. And then a third subset of them goes on to acquire an NRAS mutation. But here, the evolution branches out. And the second subclone acquires now a KRAS mutation. So that's branching evolution. Uh, but more importantly, it's convergent evolution, where two different cells independently acquire a lesion with the same phenotypic consequences. And that's a hint uh, towards a high relevance of that pathway in cancer uh, development, of course. So why is it important to know that in multiple myeloma you may have patients carrying BRAF mutations in some cells and KRAS mutations in other? The reason is that uh, while we do have BRAF inhibitors, and that's a, a story of huge success in melanoma, we also know that patients with melanoma treated with BRAF inhibitors will see a disappearance of their metastasis and will live longer, but we'll also see an increase in squamous cancers. Um, so those are completely different cancers in other cell types of the skin, uh, which arose for apparently no reason. Uh, so these uh, secondary cancers during BRAF inhibitor treatments were studied and were found to be cancers arising from cells that carried RAS mutations. So we do carry skin cells which have KRAS or NRAS mutations in our skin without developing an overt tumor because that mutation is not enough to initiate a cancer. But if you either give a second hit to that cell or a third uh, or you give a drug that works mm, in a special way, these, uh, I would say, sleeping cells will now become active and give rise to a cancer. So this was studied, and we now know the molecular mechanisms. So if you have oncogenic RAS, that signals through CRAF, and that goes to MEC and ERK, and BRAF is inhibiting in this uh, case. But what happens if you put a BRAF inhibitor to an inhibited BRAF? You will actually have a paradoxical effect whereby you relieve BRAF of this inhibition. And BRAF will now dimerize with, with CRAF downstream of oncogenic RAS, and that will increase the signaling down the pathway. So this is a very important cautionary tale to tell when uh, you try to apply a simple equation such as mutated gene drug to the patient. Uh, and there has been a proof of concept of this in vivo. So there's this very interesting case report. That's one case, but it's very instructive, where uh, doctors did exactly what I was trying to explain you. So they had a multiply relapsed multiple myeloma, which carried a BRAF uh, mutation. And this patient was treated with a BRAF inhibitor. What happened is that the tumor shrunk, 
uh, but then relapsed, and the murafenib treatment actually caused a relapse that was genotypically very different from the starting tumor because the BRAF mutation was gone. That's because the drug is very effective, but the tumor relapsed with three different clones, each carrying a different NRAS mutation. Um, so that's exactly uh, the proof of principle of what could be speculated by carefully looking at sequencing data. Uh, and and it's, an, it's an important story for doctors to, to know. Um, so now moving to more speculative aspects, we have seen how we can actually assign a mutation to the number of cells carrying it. And that's a very powerful tool into deciphering the molecular architecture of a given cancer. Uh, so as you've seen examples of how a mutation can be in 30% or 100% of the tumor, each myeloma case carries about 60 exonic mutations. And you can now uh, create histograms where these 60 mutations are clustered based on their cancer cell fraction. And what you can see uh, from the bottom graph is that uh, most myeloma cases actually have an excess of clonal mutations, which are in light blue, and a minority of subclonal mutations. So that would be the histogram on the top in the middle. So this group of mutations are mutations that were present in the first transformed cells, um, or cell, because it's one to be transformed. Um, and among those will be the ones that actually drive disease initiation. Uh, on the left, you have a minor subclone, which is um, a cluster of cells, which is genotypically different from the bulk of the tumor. Uh, so these subclonal cells will carry all the clonal mutations plus some additional ones. And we believe that if we look in this subclone, we can find the ones that are responsible for disease progression rather than initiation. But even more interestingly, you can apply this kind of analysis uh, to paired samples. Say you have the occasion to sample someone before treatment and after treatment. You can then plot um, the um, cancer cell fraction of these mutations in a graph and understand how tumors can evolve, not just spontaneously, but after treatment. And what you have here is the example of a tumor mass uh, that shrinks after treatment and then comes back. Um, so this is what you can do from serial sampling. In this case, each dot is a mutation, and the position of the dot is dictated by its cancer cell fraction before treatment, x-axis, and after treatment in the y-axis. And then you have red to give a statistical probability of these mutations be, to be present in the same group of cells, or in the same clone, you should say. So here you have a group of cells, or group of mutations, which are um, present in all cells, because they are at a position that projects to one in both sides of the graph. And here you have a cluster of mutations which are subclonal. They're present probably in 10 to 20% of cells. Uh, and because their position uh, really does not change between X and Y axis, uh, we know that uh, this cancer at relapse presented with the same genomic structure as it had before the start of treatment. But then you can have a second patient coming to your clinic with the same setting, that of a relapsed disease. After having a response, the disease comes back. You apply the same analysis, and you may come up with a graph that looks like this. So this is different from before, of course. Uh, you still have a cluster of mutations that probably identify the genotype of the ancestral clone that gives ri gave rise to that multiple myeloma. But then you have a cluster of cells here in red which were present uh, at uh, the start of treatment which are now gone at relapse. So these uh, mutations point to the genotype of a subclone of cells that has been eradicated by treatment. Uh, on the contrary, in the black circle, what you have are new mutations that were either not present or very infrequently present uh, before treatment, uh, 
And these black dots point to the genotype of a subclone of cells that were clearly resistant to treatment and led to disease relapse. Um, and of course, those were the two extremities of the spectrum, but then you can have intermediate examples, such as uh, what we call linear evolution, where you only have a gain of something without a loss of something. And then you may have intermediate scenarios where clones are not eradicated or appearing, but they either decrease or increase their frequency at relapse. But yet again, uh, we know these dots. These dots have names. They are, have names of mutated genes. And we, by applying this analysis in scale, we can hopefully learn lessons um, and learn what's uh, a genotype that may predict chemo resistance and a genotype that may predict chemo sensitivity. Um, you can make this more complicated, and we're not going to dwell into too much complicated things, but you can integrate copy number and abnormalities and mutations. Uh, the short story of this is that, interestingly, uh, tumors evolve in a fairly homogeneous fashion. So if you see changes in copy number, you will see changes in gene mutations and vice versa. So it basically looks like tumors have strategies to evolve which uh, are multimodal. They mutate, uh, they uh, rearrange um, as long as they can survive treatment. Um, and that's a much more recent paper, just from a few months ago, uh, that applied the same analysis on to a higher number of samples, uh, treated homogeneously with a drug. And um, the message of this um, graph is that uh, you can have branching, linear, or stable evolution at relapse, uh, but the clinical message is that the deeper your response, uh, the more likely you are to relapse with a branching pattern. So if, you, uh, if your drug is uh, so much effective to make your tumor disappear, uh, the relapse will probably be genetically different. Uh, whereas the stable pattern, which I've shown you earlier, is often associated with partial response. So if the tumor comes back the same it was, it was probably inherently more chemoresistant from the start. Right. Um, so we are trying to give names to those dots related to uh, chemoresistant. And the question is, can we now develop biomarkers that will predict sensitivity or resistance to genes? Uh, so there is, um, there is a huge effort, or maybe a few years ago there was, uh, to find such genes. And you can see how uh, there are interesting candidates. We know how myeloma drugs work. Uh, we know what are the potential intracellular targets. Uh, the short message here is that um, the search for biomarkers of resistance has been largely unfruitful. You can see how these proteasomal subunit genes on the right, which are supposedly target of proteasome inhibitors, are mutated in a fraction of proteasome uh, resistant cells. But if you look at the y-axis, it goes up to 2.5, and that's percent. So it's one patient in what? In well, let me help, help me do the math in one, one patient in 20, one patient in 50. So that's very infrequent. So these are chemoresistant samples. These mutations are very infrequent within chemoresistant samples. Um, so in, in our group at the Instituto Tumori, we tried to ask the same questions, like uh, what if we now sequence a, a larger number of patients that are homogeneously refractory to drugs? Um, and out of our effort, we found uh, answers that are equally um, unsatisfactory. So we know that relapsed and refractory multiple myeloma has more mutations, it's more complex. Uh, we couldn't find the smoking gun uh, in the form of a gene that consistently predicts resistance. The only, um, I would say, underwhelming result we could find was that P53, which is a gene, of course, associated with resistance to apoptosis and to drugs, is more frequently mutated in samples that show chemoresistance in the clinic. Um, 
Nevertheless, we have developed a, a fairly handy tool to perform extended genotyping of multiple myeloma cases, and that may even have some clinical applications in the future. You can see, again, these circus plots, which are examples of three individual patients, two of which have trisomies. You see the red lines, uh, meaning amplifications of chromosomes, and the patient in the middle that has a translocation. We can annotate in the inner circle mutated genes, and we can tell whether these mutated genes are mutated in all cells of the tumor or only in part uh, of the cells of the tumor. And, and once again, what we could find in this representative case is that P53 is mutated in all cells, and the second allele is now deleted. So this case has... Um, uh, a biallelic P53 loss, which of course is what we believe drives chemoresistance. Uh, we do know that some drug targets, such as uh, IKZF3 and Cereblon, um, those are drug targets, but we see them mutated in only a fraction of cells, so it would be hard to justify the chemoresistance of the whole tumor through the presence of a subclonal mutation. Um, so really what we found uh, by analyzing a large number of uh, myeloma refractory cases, and, and I'm sorry this doesn't show up, you've seen it before, uh, is that surprisingly when it comes to chemoresistance, so a, a multiple myeloma case that will not shrink even by a little uh, with um, further treatment, uh, we were expecting to see a cancer that was homogeneously carrying uh, adverse lesions, but indeed we find the opposite. We find that as compared to, to diagnosis, uh, the genome of uh, multiple myeloma in the resistant phases is more complex, is more heterogeneous, and it's made by a larger number of subclonal mutations, which has implications because of course it means by treatment we're selecting a lot, uh, and what we're selecting is actually uh, a bunch of different cells that acquire chemoresistance probably through different mechanisms. So we now have uh, a catalog of high-risk lesions present in different subclones of the cells which make the disease very hard to treat because for any treatment you, came, you may come up with, there probably is a clone that's inherently resistant to that treatment and that's different from the start. So to recap and move to the last part of the talk, um, um, we do see a lot of heterogeneity in multiple myeloma, a lot of complex subclonal structure, and our pair sample analysis shows that evolution can be different and this has re uh, implications for assessment of response and of course prediction of response to treatment. So in the last part of the talk, I'll give you uh, another uh, example of how genomics can be applied to the clinic, and that's applied to the field of mo smoldering multiple myeloma, which is the asymptomatic phase where you do have cancer cells, but the cells are not doing any harm to the patient. So these patients with smoldering myeloma may progress to multiple myeloma, but some of them do it quite quickly. Some others do it only after years, and some others never actually progress. And we're not doing very well in predicting who can do one or the other type of progression. So the question, of course, is whether genomics can help us into improving our abilities to predict. And what we did here was perform a whole genome sequencing. Now we started to sequence the whole of the genome, not just the exome. Uh, and here we have an example of a smoldering myeloma case that was sequenced at the time of smoldering and at the time of progression towards active or uh, symptomatic multiple myeloma. Uh, so again, circus plots, mutations are on the outer circle, copy number is in the middle, and lines are rearrangements. So the first message here is that there is an increase of mutations between smoldering and symptomatic phases, which is it's in itself interesting, but what's even more interesting is how these mutations distribute. So it's not just that there's more of them. But what we did find is even here, and here there's no treatment, here it's spontaneous evolution, we could find that smoldering myelomas can either progress 
through loss of some mutations and gain of others, or can just progress without any change of their uh, subclonal structure. So that has implications. Because these cases, which we call the static progression, are probably genomically de facto multiple myeloma already, even if the clinic tell us that these are uh, not causing any end organ damage. Probably these cases just need more time to produce end organ damage to satisfy clinical criteria. And in fact, these cases in our hands are the ones that progressed much more quickly than the others. So every time you need a genomic shift in the form of a branching evolution of, in this case, it usually takes more time for the tumor to evolve uh, because, of course, at the time of the first sampling, what you sampled was not an aggressive tumor from a genomic and clinical point of view. Um, and I think I'll make it very short, but uh, one limitation of this analysis is that you can only know after the patient has evolved, so that's not helpful for the patient. So you may ask, what, what can I look in the first sample to find uh, determinants of progression that may predict high risk? And one question is that of mutational signatures. Um, so that relates to a, a branch of the genomics where we study why we get mutations. And the reason why we get mutations is that there are proteins that replicate the DNA, uh, repair the DNA, that may make errors. These errors can be traced back to the protein that causes them, and these are called mutational processes. Um, and we know that, uh, as you know, AID, that's the protein that causes multiple myeloma to arise in the germinal center to start with, uh, we found that this AID protein is active in very early stages of multiple myeloma. So all the clones that we labeled as one, these are the ancestral clone, they have signs of AID activity. But AIDS, AID shuts down uh, during myeloma treatment, during myeloma natural life history. And what happens is that in later subclones, which are the ones associated with progression, we find activity of other mutational processes which we can identify and trace, and we believe those represent a higher risk of transformation. Uh, and here you have this different aid to APOBEC. APOBEC is this aberrant mutational process that really kicks in uh, in evolving cases, and by measuring this ratio, we believe we can assign a risk of multiple myeloma progression. So uh, to briefly move to the conclusion, uh, I'll give you an illustrative example of how powerful genomics can be in predicting life history of a cancer. Here we have now a three-way sampling of a smoldering myeloma evolving spontaneously to newly diagnosed, which then is treated and then relapses in the form of relapsed and refractory. So here we have three cases uh, from the same patient, three samples from the same patient, and we can perform pairwise comparison and identify subclones, which can go up and down depending on the different stages. And by this, we can actually reconstruct a phylogenetic tree where we have clone number one, which is the subclinical clone, which uh, which really contains the drivers of initiation. Uh, and we know that um, at the time of smoldering myeloma, so when the disease became um, evident, even if not symptomatic, there was a branching towards the right, a very short branching, because there was a subclone, which we called number four, which has a low number of lesions uh, that nevertheless made the disease evident. But, there was not just that, spontaneously, uh, out of, sub of uh, subclone one branched out subclone number two. And subclone number two formed the basis of a symptomatic progression. So this is all spontaneous. Subclone number two wiped out subclone number four and led through further acquisition of subclone number three to a newly diagnosed multiple myeloma. So here the myeloma is causing end organ damage and requires treatment. So what was done here was to treat this smoldering myeloma, I'm sorry, this newly diagnosed myeloma, and treatment was not effective in wiping out the subclone number two. So treatment only wiped out subclone number three 
and out of subclone number two branched out a subclone number five, which was responsible now for the chemoresistant genotype. And again, we can give names to what's in clone one, two, three, four, and five. And what we found here is that uh, evolution was driven by this biallelic CDKN2C deletion in subclone number two. So CDKN2C is a tumor suppressor. It's a negative regulation of the cell cycle. Um, and this gene was he um, heterozygously deleted in the ancestral clone. Uh, then the smoldering clone did, ha did not have anything to do with CDKN2C. But out of subclone one, one cell acquired now a biallelic deletion of CDKN2C. And that was uh, such a dramatic shift of the genotype that cells acquiring this uh, biallelic CDKN2C deletion uh, evolved into symptomatic and later refractory multiple myeloma. And uh, I think I'll leave it here, but the message of this slide is that you can now perform a single cell analysis to dig even deeper into the heterogeneity and evolution of multiple myeloma. Uh, and of course, if you analyze a number of cases, you can trace the life history of these cases uh, at scale and hopefully learn lessons that will be helpful for the clinic. All right, so these are my conclusions. Uh, a lot of heterogeneity, as you understand. Uh, of course, new uh, fields of research in multiple myeloma involve the use of single cell techniques to dissect this heterogeneity. Um, and what we learned is that gene mutations in multiple myeloma are certainly late events and structural variance is what really drives uh, evolution. So I'll say um, thank you uh, for thank you for listening and thanks to uh, of course uh, University of Milan Instituto Tumori, the group led by Professor Corradini who gave me the opportunity to bring my research back to Italy and to all the international collaborations which even nowadays, uh, are always very helpful and a source of inspiration. Thank you very much. Okay, so we have uh, a few minutes for questions from the students first. They're not gonna, okay. Um, but these samples, I'm just wondering, were they acquired from a primary site or from the periphery? Because, I mean, logically, you would think that a peripheral sample is going to show Differences. a higher rate of deletion, deletions or mutations. So that's an interesting question, um, and, and it's a very important one. In multiple myeloma and in hematological cancers, we tend to think that these cancers are liquid, to use a horrible word which would mean that wherever you sample, you should have the same thing because these cells would travel. Um, now, that may be the case for acute leukemias, but in multiple myeloma, we know that there is a spatial heterogeneity. Uh, nevertheless, we never recognize a primary site because the primary site would be the bone marrow in multiple myeloma. And you, know, you sample the bone marrow from one point. Uh, all the data I've shown you are from bone marrow sampling. Um, so those should be fair comparisons to, to answer your question, and we believe these are actual uh, examples of evolution. We did sequence a couple of plasma cell leukemias, which would be, would you call it a metastatic spread? I don't know, it's a, we don't use metastasis in hematological malignancies, but to give an idea. We sequenced uh, a couple of malignant ascites, and you're right, their differences are even more pronounced. Um, so yes, uh, myeloma thrives on the uh, microenvironment, and every time you find these myeloma cells in fluids of the body, roaming free, uh, that means they evolved very dramatically to proliferate and survive independently of the microenvironment. So when you do that, you increase the number of differences you see from the bone marrow, which is the primary site. Any other point? I think you can shout now. Um, 
Yeah. So th there is a bunch of uh, papers that um, we know from prostate, we know from kidney, um, those are the ones I know of at least, that there there is spatial heterogeneity and you can actually trace the life history of the tumor from the primary site to the metastatic site, and you can actually tell what led to metastasis and what led to bigger metastasis. Um, in hematological cancers, we have a bit of an easier life because, again, we probably wrongly, but we assume that through uh, drawing some blood from the bone marrow, we have an average of the tumor wherever it is in the body. Even in that scenario, uh, this evolution uh, that I've shown you has been described very in a very detailed fashion, at least for uh, acute myeloid leukemias and CLL, a chronic lymphocytic leukemia. So it, it, it you know, it's intuitive. Um, these cancers have a fair degree of genomic instability, and they tend to escape, um, and they do so by rearranging, mutating. Uh, probably the example where this is slightly less prominent is normal karyotype AML. Uh, so there, the changes are less pronounced, but you will always, even there, find additional driver mutations in the form of point mutations, not gross rearrangements, which can explain chemoresistance and relapse. So it is a fairly universal way uh, for cancers to escape chemotherapy or treatment in general. Somebody else? Okay. Yeah. I want to share just, uh, f first of all, thank you very much indeed for your very, very nice presentation. But I want just to share with you a, a, a thought, a comment on that. Listening to this talk, uh, you can be from uh, a bit discouraged feeling or be enthusiastic. Enthusiastic because you say, what a fascinating tool. Now, you can dissect the heterogeneity, talking about cancer, but we'll listen in the, in, in the day, other disease where you will dissect uh, the pathway. And then from the other side, be discouraged because you say, well, it, I'm going to deal with the patient to patient variability. So basically, I would be, at the end of the day, I would be in the position to give the treatment specific for, for each patient and how is possible. But I want to be positive. My generation grew up with the concept to give uh, aggressive therapy and being successful, I have to say, at least talking about pediatric cancer, I have to say definitely yes. But the key message that you have to take as a key message of this, of, uh, of this talk is to, that the future is to be more smart and less hard. These are the key message. Because uh, it is true. You will have to attack the cancer cell by different target approach. Do we have successful example in medicine? Oh, yes. The success of HIV therapy has been multiple target drug. So we do an example. Cancer is likely to be more complicated, okay? But that is the way to look the future. Of course, even thinking, and you are bright, and you definitely find a solution to have even different method to develop because it's unlikely that you will have a target, single target. No cancer will be defeated by having a single drug. We will need multiple drug, multiple target, but keep in mind, be more smart and less hard. That is going to be the future. So thank you. Marco Bolli for you. Okay.
If no other question burning, uh, which can be done uh, during the coffee break, the coffee break is open, but it's going to be shortened. <laughs> mm -hmm. So it's, you have to be back in 15 minutes in the room. So rush. Grazie Massimo, grazie.